Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along today, particularly on a Friday. The US dollar has made new highs. Reserve banks are making surprise decisions. If you can't trust a Swiss banker, then who can you trust? <laughs> the price of oil per litre has dropped so low that it's about the same as the price of a bottle of premium European bottled water. Our best banks have just lost 15% in about four weeks. It should be a trader's paradise, but market behaviour has changed, and to put it simply, equity volatility sucks. And that's why we've moved to looking at FX trading. And as an equity trader for the past 20 plus years, we needed to adapt to these new market conditions. And today, I want to explain how we did that and why we did that. If we look at bubbles, and hopefully I can get this one working correctly, there we go, very good. There are a number of features that look, that are characteristics of bubbles. First of all, we have secular index trend stability. So the underlying trend in the S&P is well established and likely to continue. There are no end of trend chart patterns that are developing. There are no triple tops, there are no rounding tops, there's no head and shoulder patterns. So the secular trend is intact. But what we're seeing is increasing trend instability these sorts of major drops that are taking place on a fairly regular basis. So within the underlying trend, there's a lot of equity instability. It makes it very difficult to trade and it makes it difficult to invest. There are volume droughts. When you want to buy, there's nothing there. When you want to sell, there's nothing there. It makes it extremely hard to execute some of your strategies at the size or the quantity that you want to be able to do. So for us, that signals that there is an opportunity within the FX market where some of these factors are not present. It makes it easier to analyse, easier to trade, easier to execute. But there are about six problems for equity traders. And these are additional features that contribute to this bubble environment. We look at the impact of these first. It's a depressing landscape, but we have a solution that can put the smile back onto the face of traders. It encourages us to shift to FX trading, but that requires some adjustment to our trading skills. But first of all, what are the reasons? What are the worms that help destroy? Ah, there we go. I keep on pressing the wrong button. What are the reasons for equity bubbles in the current situation? There's actually three, and I left one off, unfortunately. First, it's HFT, high frequency trading. That has changed the nature and the structure of the equity market that we're working in. The second is ETFs, exchange traded funds. They are intimately linked to high frequency trading. They also change the nature and the structure of the market that we're working in. We still apply the same analysis techniques, but when it comes to trade execution, things don't work like they used to. So we have to make some changes. And the third one there is ICE, I-C-E, which I want to put in, but Max will let me put it in at the last moment. And that really stands for investment capital excess. And in that sense, Yellen is really the ice queen. You get addicted to it. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Ah, right. I'm not too sure why that's gone backwards instead of forwards. Oops. Let's go this way. Ah, there we go. So we talk about high frequency trading. What does high frequency trading really mean? First of all, it's legalised front running. The idea is that your the high frequency trader gets in front of your order before it's executed. In the old days, you used to talk to your broker. And if you're a reasonable trader, what your broker did is he put his order in before he put your order into the market. Highly illegal, very effective. That's why there's rich brokers and poor traders. <laughs> high frequency trading does the same thing. And it's facilitated by the exchanges. So what it means is that when you place your order on direct market access, in the sub-seconds before it appears on the order line, the high frequency traders intercept that and they will take an edge off it. They will get executed before you do. Do the exchanges encourage it? Of course they do. Because what they do is they are selling proximity access to the high frequency traders. Remember, for those of you who are a bit older than I am, back in the 1930s, one of the leading broker claims 
for why you should use us was that we are close to the exchange. Our runners can get to the exchange quicker than our competitors. Now that disappeared in the 80s and the 90s and the early part of this century. Now it's back. The advantage goes to those dealers who are the closest physically to the exchanges so that the time between order placement and order execution is reduced. High frequency trading is front running. 1970, New York Stock Exchange. On average, how long did people hold stocks for? On average. Anyone like to have a suggestion? Three years, any more? Five years. Five years, in between, four years. 2008, average holding period was? Any guesses? Six months, nine months. You can have a baby in nine months. <laughs> two months. The average holding period in 2008 was two months. 2011? Three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, you're very optimistic. <laughs> Three hours. Three hours, 20 two seconds. That's high frequency trading. That's the impact. Now obviously, that's the average. So on one end, there's holdings for less than a second. On the other end, there are obviously holdings for months and years. Today, we don't know what those figures are. High frequency trading works together with exchange traded fund trading. And hopefully I can get this button correct. No, I can't. Unfortunately, I'm left-handed, so these buttons are set up for other people, for the rest of the world. Equities and ETF, and this is where it impacts on the equity market, which is why we are finding we don't want to be involved in the equity market as much as we used to be. Exchange-traded fund trading increases volatility in the market. That's its first impact. Second, it accelerates sector trend momentum dramatically because of its size and its activity and because it concentrates the market behaviour and where it's buying and selling, it sucks liquidity out of other ends of the market, the small caps and the mid caps, no longer tradable. They look good on a chart, but when you try and buy and sell, there's nothing there to be able to get into it. That activity, that concentration, attracts high frequency traders. So they build on each other. So how's, high frequency tra uh, how's ETF trading work? What we used to do, what we still do, let's say we're interested in the banks. Don't know why we would be, but pretend that we are. And we look at the bank lineup and we own four of them, but we happen to own one that's not doing particularly well, currently going under the code of CBA. So you make a decision to sell that. You've seen the top out patterns, you want to get out. The other ones, for whatever reason, you decide to hold on to. So your selling of the poor performing stock B has no impact on A, C, and D that you hold. But if you are active in the market through an ETF, and let's face it, most retail investors out there are still terrified. They don't want to be directly involved in the market. They think the safe way is to come in via an exchange traded fund. Fair enough, there's advantages in that. But when you send your order to the ETF, I'm a bit worried about some of these banks, I want to scale back my ETF position in banks, then the ETF must sell all of the holdings to maintain its existing weighting. It can't just sell the most, the, the most poorly performer. It has to sell all of them, irrespective of the individual trends. So what's that mean? It means that when we are holding stocks A, C or D, which are in a good, strong uptrend, suddenly the trend collapses because of ETF selling, because ETF sells across the board. So the impact is on trend stability. It's not as stable as it used to be. The secular trend's there, but you've got these sharp movements that are taking place. Where do you put your stop? It has to be far enough away that it takes into account the volatility that's being driven by the exchange-traded funds. But it's that far away, then you're starting to throw risk out the window. If you're looking for a 10% correction before you get out, then you're putting too much of your profit at risk or too much of your original capital at risk. This combination of factors makes it extremely difficult for us to be able to apply the trading techniques that we used to be able to apply in equity markets. Our analysis is still good, the chart patterns are still good, it all looks great on paper, but come to theory, change from theory to practice, and the results are not attractive. Too much is written in red rather than in black. 
So, what do we need to do? And what I'm talking about today is not what you necessarily have to do, it's part of, I hate the word, the journey that we took in. We started looking at what was happening with equity trading, we weren't getting the consistency of results that were required, therefore, we need to look at leverage markets, so we do some work with CFDs, do the analysis in the equity market, execute via a CFD. There are still the same problems with liquidity of HFT trading and of ETF trading. Still have the same impact on the underlying trends. So we go back and look at the FX market. Problem is, the FX market is different. It's not the equity market. We have to change our thinking and the methods that we use and the approaches that we use. Now, hopefully I get this one right. Yep, I have. There are basically five unique features or problems in terms of the, of, of the equity markets. And I want to go briefly through them because that helps us to decide what we did, where we are and why we're doing it. First of all, the FX market is not an equity market on speed. It's not the equity market going much, much, much faster. It has different behaviours and characteristics. So the question is, why are those differences there? And one of them is because half of the FX participants are unwilling participants. They don't want to be there. Doesn't make sense, does it? Think of it. You've just ordered a couple of books off Amazon. Your bank has to settle in US dollars. Your buying, as the Treasurer tells us, is costing the Australian economy millions upon billions of dollars. So put that into your banks. The banks have to take the opposite side of your collective purchases. It doesn't matter what their house view is on Australian versus US dollar. They have an obligation to take the opposite side of your trade. Collectively, that means there's a lot of people in the market who don't actually want to be there. They're in there because they're forced because of their business model. What's the impact? It has an important impact in terms of psychological patterns in the market. In the equity market, I will look for the patterns that tell me the behaviour that's developing, the psychology of the participants in the equity market. In the FX market, it's not there because half the people don't want to be there. So that devalues a whole range of chart patterns that we cannot take or transfer from the equity market to the FX market. And I'll look at some of those in a moment or two. Secondly, it's a 24-hour market with multiple opens. Yeah, so what? Has two impacts. First, how do you construct your candle? Which open? How do you construct your bar? Which open? And I'll show you some examples in a moment. Because the way you do that changes the way you see the market. That's the first impact. The second impact, 24 hour market. I'm at an age where I like to sleep. I don't want to be awake 24 hours a day. Staying awake 24 hours in front of an FX screen is not my idea of a party. So therefore, it means that the methods I use for trading FX markets have to be shorter. I have to look at techniques that are going to get me in and out in a shorter time frame so I can get some reasonable sleep. Now luckily what I've done is I've transferred most of my FX trading activity to my son. <laughs> and luckily, he's just had our first grandchild. So guess who's awake at four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> and I do have a wonderful photograph of him feeding the grandson in front of a trading screen. But you know, okay. So it's a 24 hour market. So we have to adjust the way that we trade in that environment. There's correlated trading activities or opportunities amongst each of the currency pairs. So that also gives an opportunity to spread across like-minded patterns of behaviour. And we can see some markets move more rapidly than others. It gives us an advantage that we haven't got in the equity market. But our analysis methods must change. One of the things that I used to do, my wife didn't like it, my dog didn't like it. Every Sunday afternoon I would sit down and I would go through 2,500 stocks using a meta stock search, eyeball search, all the rest of it. It's a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Now I don't do it. I look at five currency pairs. That's it. Takes me 30 seconds. 
We do it on a daily basis. I'll show you the methods in a couple of minutes. So that's our first problem, the unique features that are sitting there. It is not the same as an equity market. We can't port the same behaviours that we use in the equity market directly into an FX market. So here's some FX patterns. Whoops. Muck that one up again. Technologically inaccurate. Yeah, there we go. Try that one. No, not that one. There we go. Okay, three patterns. Which one of these, or which ones, come from the FX market? One, two, or three? I'll get out of the way for those people on the left hand side. One, two, or three. Which one of these is an FX pattern? It's got a number. Two. Two is not the one. Okay, who thinks number one is an FX pattern? Please indicate. Number two? Who thinks number two is an FX pattern? Thank you. Number three? Okay. Number three is correct. Numbers one and two are not correct. Why not? This is a head and shoulders pattern. By the way, that's the Dow in 2007. Anyone who didn't see that head and shoulders pattern in 2007 deserved to lose money in 2008. <laughs> it's a psychological pattern. The market's gone up, I can't buy it, as Tim was saying before. Now it's come down. Yes, I'll buy it now because it's going to go higher. Jesus, I'm sorry. Gee, I was stupid. It's come back down, etc. So it's a psychological pattern in the market. It's the way people think because we want to be there. There is nobody, technically, in the equity market who does not want to be there. They may regret being there, but initially they wanted to be there, unlike the FX market where half the participants don't want to be there. Same with the rounding top. The rounding top situation, again, this gradual sell-off that takes place with a sudden collapse below the support level. That, from memory, is the uh, S&P, the same period of time. Psychological pattern. But this pattern of support and resistance of well-established and well-tested trading bands, that's what you'll see often on FX markets. It's not a psychological pattern. It's driven by other sorts of behaviours. So it's a key difference. I can't take, we can't take our psychological analysis of the market and those psychological patterns and apply them to the FX market. Now, there is another massive problem, which is a disappointment for people like myself who trade equities, in the FX markets, and that is there's no inside trading. It's a real problem. In the equity market, the best inside trading market in the world is Australia. And we have a worldwide reputation for it, by the way, despite what ASIC and other regulators will tell you. It's Australia, followed by Malaysia, followed perhaps by China. <coughs> but we're the world leaders, one of the best things we do. And we developed a whole range of strategies around identifying inside trading, getting ahead of that, joining it, or avoiding it. And there's a whole lot of patterns that come into that. In the FX market, it's not there. Now, of course, this is a famous example, which the Reserve Bank released uh, Australian trade reports, and five seconds before the official release, the market jumped dramatically. And that was evidence of inside trading as far as ASIC was concerned. Unfortunately, no one in ASIC knows how to read a chart. Spent hundreds of thousands of dollars working that out. Every Australian currency pair moved five seconds before the official trade release. What's it tell you? It tells you that the Reserve Bank wasn't as secure about its market information release as it ought to have been, that it came out five seconds earlier. And markets react very, very quickly in relation to that. And when we see it across here, on the rise and on the fall, exactly the same lags. They got it better last time. The market didn't move until 1400, until the actual time of the release. So there's no inside trading. There's no conspiracy theories. There are manipulated markets, and there are a number of major world banks who are above suspicion, who are currently, in Australia anyway, who are currently paying a large number of fines for manipulating FX markets in Europe and England. We can work within that manipulation in the same way as we can with inside trading. But it is a disadvantage. There is a waste of time looking for inside trading activities or patterns taking place in the FX market. The second problem, or well, the third problem, I'm going to get this right eventually. Ah, there we go. No, we don't. I'm sorry about this technical hitch. Yeah, there's no space bar on this. Okay, there's another one sitting here. Let's see how we go. Ah, there we go. We'll use this one instead. 
Candles. Which one of these candles is correct? If we take New York Open, this is what the 24-hour candle looks like. If we take the Asian Open, it looks like this. If we take the UK Open, it looks like this. You don't need an extensive knowledge of candle chat and pattern analysis to know that each of these candles has a completely different meaning. So how on earth can you apply candlestick analysis accurately to an FX chart? The answer is you can't. That doesn't give you a solution. It doesn't mean you can't trade. You certainly can if you are consistent in the way in which you're applying. And most of the candles are based on the New York Open. But it does not give you an accurate picture of the underlying market. So we have to come up with a solution for that. And we'll look at that as we go on as well. And of course, the other problem is the FX trading day. It's at very inconvenient hours for most of us if we want to follow particular opens or closes. So this is based on the Sydney Open, Frankfurt Opens at four o'clock, etc. But the key factor, because it's a 24 hour market, that close to open gaps are extremely rare. The market reacts instantly to changes in information. So you've got to be able to move much more rapidly. And we see this here. These are five second moves prior to the release across the entire market, across all of the currency pairs. We can't trade these. Not unless you've got an awful lot of luck, and no, I don't have that much luck. So what we do is we stand aside from the market prior to any of the major releases. That's another strategy that we do. Instead of anticipating news, which we used to do with the equity market, you know, that wonderful stuff. The regulator issues a speeding ticket. The company director says, we have absolutely no knowledge of what might have caused this dramatic spike in prices. And the price falls back about 5%. Buy, for goodness sake, buy, because he's lying. <laughs> absolutely clear, it's a wonderful strategy. And about four weeks later, he says, oh, you know what we told you four weeks ago? That's actually wrong. We were in negotiations, and it's now we can officially announce it, and the price goes up. It's not inside trading, it's informed trading. <laughs> Some are more informed than others. Doesn't happen in the FX market. So we can't apply those techniques, and when we see patterns of chart behaviour that look similar, they are coincidental, not correlated. And that's one of the biggest challenges, being able to shift what we know from equity markets into FX markets and saying it looks the same, smells the same, quacks the same, but it's not a duck. It's a platypus. It's quite different to what we're looking for. And finally, there are fewer but better opportunities. Remember, our purpose with analysing 2,500 equity stocks is to narrow it down to a handful of stocks that we want to trade on any given day or any given week. Same in the FX market. But what we're looking for, and we start with what we want to achieve, what we're looking for is a tactical trade where we're looking to 50 to 60 pips a trade up to 160 plus, depends on market conditions. So we're looking for not massive moves. We don't want to move five and six and seven and eight and nine cents. We're not interested in long-term trading. We're interested in short-term tactical trading. Average trade is open anywhere between 20 minutes and two or three hours, full stop, then we're closed. The objective is to get the entry and exit consistently right and then use size to generate the returns, not the number of trades. In the equity market, we generally want to have three or four or five or six trades, all about the same size, so we've got to consistently, continually find new opportunities all the time. It gets exhausting. It's one of the reasons I don't have as much hair as I used to have. But with the FX market, we can identify one opportunity and because of the size of the market versus our size, we can buy as much as we want. There are no limitations generally on the size of the position that we want to take. So it overcomes that liquidity problem. It overcomes that lack of liquidity that's appearing within the equity markets. When we see the situation, when we identify the opportunity, when we've got a method that gives us entry exit consistently, we can trade the size that gives the best sort of return. But we limit the candidates 
to five pairs. So every day we do a particular set of analysis and we take the top five currency pairs that meet those conditions. They are the only trading candidates that we will use. We have been looking at how this can extend to other markets and we apply this to index trading, we apply it to commodity trading. What we have been finding, and those of you who are newsletter readers, which I hope you all are, but if you're not you should be, <laughs> those of those who are newsletter readers, what we've got in today's issue, it comes out tonight, is the application of this selection technique to blue chip stocks in the Australian equity market. Yes? Who, who I'm not allowed free advertising, sorry. Who are we? Who are we? Yeah. Which we? The royal we? Keep saying we do this, we do oh, sorry, us, guppy traders. So that's myself, my team. And I say we because we've also worked with a number of traders in the UK, which I'll explain in a minute or two, who've come on as well. So we in that sense, yep. So five pairs is where we're at. That's all we're looking at. So what we call it, we call it ANTS trading. And it's called ANTS for a number of reasons. That's what it looks like, and I'm sorry that chart's a little bit washed out. I'll give you an example of what it is. So we apply it to FX trading, to index trading, to commodity trading. We can't apply the ANTS system to equity trading, but the selection method we use to identify the top five currencies, indexes or commodities is generating some very useful results on the Australian market on the blue chip level. Execution is via a CFD to take advantage of the leverage that's there. So, the components. The components of the ANTS system are range bars, super guppy, an ATR application based on the range bars, and then the application of the ANTS uh, algorithm that identifies both trend changes and entry points. The combination of the range bars with the guppy multiple moving average and the ATR calculations is a conceptual breakthrough. It uses the same philosophy, but it's a different step. It's a different process to what we've applied to the equity markets. We use the ANTS signals for both entry and exit, and they provide a practical application of this particular concept. It's a significant and major change that's taken place in our thinking about the application of GMMA, the understanding of volatility, and so on. And yes, it's not my particular work. What happened is I had an email one day from a couple of traders in the UK saying, we've developed this particular system. It's based around guppy multiple moving average. We want your permission to be able to use this because we're thinking of commercialising it. I said, yeah, that's okay. Give us a look at what you're doing. They sent it through. And they had independently reached some conclusions that we'd been trying to reach for two or three years but I'd gone down a different path. They'd taken a shortcut. So they developed some solutions which answered the questions that I was asking about volatility, how to measure it, how to trade it, how to manage it. But it wasn't really a trading system. It was just a good idea. So I said, well, look, this has some room for improvement. We sat down and we co-developed what we call the ANT system. And that's what I want to explain probably a little bit briefly to you as we go through today. So, first of all, it starts with range bars. Remember, candles are a big problem in the FX market. Depending on which opening you choose, the shape of the candle and the combination of candle patterns is different. So we overcome this by using a range bar because the range bar is the same size in all time zones. The construction of the range bar captures the significant price movements. The shift to a new bar is determined by price activity, not the time elapsed. So a candle is time-based. Every 30 minutes, every 20 minutes, every one hour, whatever. Irrespective of what price is doing, it captures the high, the low, the open and the close for that time period. A range bar doesn't worry about time. It is an advance beyond point and figure charting. Now, point and figure charting has gone out of fashion. It disappeared largely once the open cry trading floors disappeared. In the old days of open cry, people would sit, stand on the floor and on a piece of paper, using X and O's, they would mark the rise and the fall of price. 
and that was used for analysis of the market very, very broadly. There are a number of point-and-figure practitioners around, and I work with a number of them uh, still in the US, but it's fallen out of favour. The key feature of point-and-figure, it removed time from the equation and focused on price activity. You can do that with uh, three-bar net, with Renko charting and so on. They're not a good, complete solution. So what the range bar does is it defines the level of acceptable price activity. It says if it moves this much, it's not really important. But once it moves more than that, we need to add a new X or an O or a new range bar to the chart display. So it eliminates time. So once we move beyond, and we'll use this as the definition, we're using candles here, but we'll use this as the definition of the range bar. It moves within this price. So this might be a three minute chart. Once we move beyond there, then we would add a new range bar. Once we move beyond the defined limit, we add the range bar. So a range bar here changes to a range bar there. It's not always an easy concept to get your head around, so I'm going to do it very, very briefly here. Here's some charts compared. Here's a time-based chart, standard candle chart. A long period of sideways movement followed by a very fast up move. It's the fast up move that we want to be able to trade. But we're going to have to sit in front of that screen for an awful long time before we get that breakout. How do we define the breakout? Where's the support resistance level on that chart? You can play around with it, but it's very difficult to put there. Is there a clear break from the trend line? Not really. To some extent, this move takes place out of nowhere. So how can we refine that? If we use a point and figure chart, we get this sort of behaviour. So the period on the time chart here is compressed into this period with the point and figure chart. X and O is moving sideways. Not the sort of thing you want to do if you're going to look at it if you want to try and stay awake. And when the price move takes place, it shows up as a single column of Xs. Okay, that gives us more information than the time-based chart, but it doesn't allow us to act within this period. Whereas the range bar chart is a sort of combination of both of them. So the period of inactivity is compressed, but the period of fast-moving activity, where we really want to be trading, is expanded. We get much more detail in here. This period here may extend for five or six hours. This period here may extend for two or three minutes, but has many more bars, range bars taking place in it. So we're concentrating on the move of price activity, not the elapse of time. Now, it's a key factor. It's a key change in the way that we see a chart. And someone's going to ask me the question, so I'll give you the answers. In terms of range bar size, it depends on the instrument that you are trading. And you can get this off the website later on, so you don't need to write it all down now. If you're trading Dow E-minis, we're using one tick as our base. The direction of the trend is on a 10 tick or 10R, 10 range bar chart, and the entry is based on a 2R chart, on a 2 tick chart. NASDAQ, like crude, gold, yen, all other FX pairs, it's all sitting there. You don't need to copy those down. They are available on the ATA website. The key factor is that these calculations tell us the size of each of these range bars, what this trading band is, what constitutes a significant move. We use the 10R chart, 10 range bar chart, to understand the direction of the trend. We use the 2R chart to identify the exact entry and exit points. So we're looking at a bigger picture, narrowing it down to a smaller picture. Let's take a shift sideways. That allows me to put a basic chart display. But what I want to understand also is volatility, not just the price movements. So for that, I want to use an ATR calculation. And there are two important differences taking place here, so I'm going to explain each of these slightly differently. Average true range. Now, five-day average true range of price is a combination of today's high to low, yesterday's close to today's high, yesterday's close to today's low. Pick whichever is the largest move. Luckily, we have software that automatically does it. We don't have to be mentally stressed from it. From these relationships, we get the highest calculation for that one day, which is 130. And we do that, in this case, for each of the five-day periods. 
So it's 130, 90, 150, 70 and 100. Total of 540 over five days. So the five day average true range value is 108. So that tells us that if price moves more than 108, it could be cents, it could be pips, whatever, if it moves more than 108, then it's exceeded the normal five day volatility of that price move. That gives me an important edge. Because if it's exceeded the volatility, it suggests that there's a trend change that's likely to develop. So I can use that both as an entry technique and as a stop loss technique. And I'll, maybe I should just, no, I won't, I'll do that in a minute. We can apply that, and we do this quite successfully, to a normal equity chart on a time-based chart. Each candle one day, each bar one day, and we use an ATR, and what we call traders ATR, as a trailing stop. But we also want a different concept. I want the average daily range of price. So we're using two different concepts here. Average daily range is just a simple calculation. So we're looking at the five day average range of price from low to high. So during the day, we have lots of price activity. If our range bar is defined as 100 ticks, we just want to keep this simple at the moment, 100 ticks, then our move for the day is 100. The move for the next day is 130, 90, 80, 90. So each of these moves is captured there within the day. So each of these range bars is the same size. During the day, the total move is 100. The next day, the total move is 130, 90, 80, 90. Same values as before. So we get 490 over five days. So the five day average daily price range is 98. So what? We both have calculated, by the way, on the ANTS website, and it will give you the five day average range for all of the currency pairs. Click the top of the five day ADR, and they'll be sorted from highest to lowest. So 583 pips, 407 pips, 394 pips, 348, 339. That's where I'm hunting. That's all I'm going to look at today. Further down the screen, you've got the same calculations for a large number of commodities, a large number of indexes. These markets trade statistically. They do not trade psychologically. So if I take the average calculation of the IQs in this room, I come up with a figure which I might be able to use for. Useful. Helps me understand behaviour. If I count the average number of people going out of those doors during the break, I get a different calculation, a statistical calculation. Apply it in this environment and it tells us 583 for GBPH, Jeff, 583 pips is the five day average daily range. There is, let's take 75% of that value. There is an 85% probability that tomorrow's price move will achieve 75% of the five day ADR. Think about it. I can set up a trade, calculate 75% of the value of 585 or 583 pips, and there is an 85% probability that the market will reach that target. That's the sort of probability I like working in my favour. Yes. They're the five currency pairs I trade. And that will change from day to day. So when I look at this list tomorrow, the constituents of that top five group will be different. Am I going to trade all five? No. I'm going to look for which one of those pairs gives me an ANTS entry signal. That's the key difference. Because although I can trade 583, I might not get a valid entry signal in that environment. So that's the next set of steps that we'll move on to. So. This is now based on what we call super guppy. Now I know I've put on weight, but it's not related to that particular aspect of guppy environment. We call it super guppy because it has a larger number of lines in the longer term group of moving averages. Now I'm going to do something here that annoys, going to annoy at least part of the audience, but maybe not. 
We're being told that there are a significant number of people here who have not ever been to an ATA conference before. So I'm going to have to ask, who understands the GMMA concept? Please put your hand up. And if you don't put your hand up, you're going to be bored to tears in the next five minutes. Unfortunately, you're going to be bored to tears anyway because there's a number of people who didn't put their hands up. It underpins here. But the key factor of the Super Guppy is it provides a better definition of trend strength and of the probability of trend retreat. We can more accurately identify that this is a major change in the trend, not just a minor retracement. Doesn't matter what the time frame is. We can more reliably use it to identify pullback opportunities and retracement opportunities. And it comes from both this extra group of moving averages that are put in and because this is applied to a range bar chart, not to a time chart. So, very briefly, and I promise to take no more than five minutes, Guppy Multiple Moving Averages. It's a combination of two groups of moving averages. And in an equity market, we say they capture the behaviour of investors, the red group, and the behaviour of traders, the blue group. It's based on fractal repetition. I told you it was going to be quick. Fractal repetition is the idea that we see the same behaviours or patterns repeated on increasingly different timescales. Those of you who have worked with Fibonacci, Elliott Wade to some extent, understand this particular concept. We use it slightly differently. So we look at this fractal here, then the pattern we see in one, if we expand that, it looks the same as square two. If we take that small box in square two, expand it, it looks the same as square three. So on each of these scales, the patterns are repeated. We see the same thing with the GMMA. So on the short term group, blue group here, we see compression that takes place followed by expansion. When we see the long term group, we see the same compression and expansion behaviour. This gives us a window of opportunity and it works simply because we are all intelligent and informed people. The biggest difference between today and 1930 is that information is instantly available to everybody. Character and structures of our markets are different. The Wall Street Journal in 1930 consisted of about six pages, a bit like the free newspaper in your suburb. At one stage, it got up to weighing a kilo and a half. All that information was available. Now, as we know, we keep on being told we're a share-owning nation, the number of participants in the market are much, much greater than they used to be. As was noted in the previous presentation, the 1930s, only a very small proportion of the population was involved in the market. Now there's a lot more of us. So what are we all doing? We're trying to find the next stock that's going to go up 350% in the next four days. So we use all sorts of information, advisory sheets, fundamental analysis, that's not a good method but anyway, technical analysis, CNBC, all the rest of it. And we all reach the conclusion that this particular stock is excellent buying at $7.50. Even Warren Buffett says $7.50. Fundamentally, great. Now, of course, this is an expensive secret. You've all paid money to come here. You all know that this is going to be worth $7.50. What are you going to do on Monday morning? Who's going to pay $7.50 to get into this stock knowing that everyone else knows it? Please indicate. See, smarter than the average bear. Who's going to pay $7.60 or $70 to get into the stock because that proves it's going up? Some of you. Who's going to pay and wait and say, ah, $7.50, it'll come back to $7.30, $7.40? Who's waiting in that situation? Okay, you do all the shopping on the weekends at Harvey Norman when they have the extra specials on. Point is, we're all looking at the same information, same chart, but where we decide to execute is different. We can track that behaviour using multiple moving averages. Short term group tells us what traders are thinking. Compression tells us agreement about price. This is not fixed price shopping in the market. If everyone agrees on price, the only way we can get a position is by bidding higher. So we see an expansion of the averages. Of course, when I buy a stock, I don't have to tell anyone. My wife doesn't need to know unless it's profitable. Pity the poor fund managers. There they are. Someone's come up with this bright idea that this stock was good buying at $7.50. But 
But he has to go to a meeting on Monday morning and he has to convince all of these other people, first, the technical analysis works, secondly, that this is the stock they need to be in. Now convincing a room full of hardened investment managers is pretty difficult. It takes them six weeks to work out the paper trail, let alone to make a decision to buy. But eventually they do. And one of the great things about the fund management industry, they all think exactly the same. They use the same methods, the same techniques, and they always look over their shoulder. They're buying it, we ought to be buying it. They're buying it as well, we better get it now. So we see the same pattern, compression behaviour, expansion. The expansion is like an airbag in the market. It tells us that's where investors are coming in. As price comes back, they say, ah, we should have bought it there, we'll buy it here now. That supports the underlying trend. But as you can see from oops, this chart here, there's the one I want, traders make a decision much, much quicker, investors are slow to buy. So we've got this window of opportunity that sits here. Great for the equity market, we've made tons of money out of that over years and years and years. Pity it doesn't work in the FX market. Put that thought to one side. Super Guppy solves that particular problem. Let's go back to ATR. ATR is one of those concepts that sounds like it ought to be really good, and as soon as you pick it up, it just turns to rubbish. How do you display ATR? Average true range value. Wild Wilder, Wilds Wilder is a smart guy. But I find it difficult to use ATR for anything for trading. I want to use it as a stop. I want to pick up those changes in volatility that tell me there's a high probability the trend is changing. Normal display, it's either underneath the chart or we can put it underneath the price movement. So we know that we want to look at changes in volatility. But if I use this as a stop, what? I lower my stop? It's a great way to poverty. So what we do is we use the ATR calculation, but when the ATR value drops, we simply project the previous higher value at the same level until the ATR reading is higher than that. Then we follow the ATR value, again, project sideways. So it becomes a trailing stop loss. Now Chuck Bow years ago developed what he called a chandelier concept. The difference between what we do and what Chuck LeBeau was doing is Chuck's chandelier, his ATR ratchet moving upwards, would get tighter and tighter and tighter, a defined uh, reduction that took place. We don't use that. We just use the raw ATR figure. And in the equity market, this is what we do. This is a range bar chart, but we still do the same in the equity market. We can use the ATR value on the downside to manage a short trade. When there is a close above the short side ATR, we'll take a long side trade and use the ATR value as the stop loss. When there's a close via the ATR value, we're out of the trade. Now we use this as a standalone method in equity markets. Delivers consistent, steady, reliable profits. So why aren't we trading equities? You can't execute at the price I want to execute. I can't buy the size I want to be able to buy. Perfect chart patterns, perfect indicator signals, untradeable. Yes, I can execute via a CFD, but again, not always the benefits and returns that I want for the risk that's there. So here, what we've done is we've applied the ATR calculation to a range bar chart. So the five-day ATR, sorry, ADR, the five-day ADR is based on the range activity, not the time activity. So we're still doing a five bar calculation, but the range bar here may have been created over two days, this one over 20 minutes, this one over half a day. So we're picking up the significant changes in price and using this ATR calculation to generate the entry and exit conditions. It becomes a derivative of a derivative. And what we find is that that significantly improves the reliability of this signal. It was pretty good before, but applying to a range bar chart increases the reliability of that signal dramatically. And it increases the reliability of the stop loss dramatically as well. 
take that thought, put it to one side. All this comes together in a moment, hopefully in one revelationary moment. Super Guppy. Super Guppy is not based on a time-based underlying chart. It's based on range bars. We're not looking at the psychology of the market. Same principles apply. Compression shows agreement. Expansion shows disagreement. But what we find, if you look at this here, here's our short-term group, here's our long-term group. The window of opportunity is smaller. On the time-based chart, when you can start getting the early GMMA signals off the traders group and confirmation from the investors group of averages, the window is quite wide. It may extend for two or three weeks. Not so good on the FX market, even if you're applying it to um, a chart that's based on one minute uh, candles. You can still be looking at a window of opportunity that's 30, 40, 50 minutes wide. But by using the underlying chart as a range bar chart, the window of opportunity for this signal to develop is significantly reduced. That's the point one. Point two, it's much, much more reliable. When we apply the ATR calculation on the range bar chart, as you can see, we use this as a trailing stop loss. And we can ride this all the way through up to this point here. But you can see there are a number of false exit signals that are developed along here. So we need to overcome those. It's good but it's not perfect. So for that, we apply the ANT trading system. Now this is a proprietary algorithm developed by, as I said, a couple of colleagues in the, in the UK. So what it does is, first of all, there are two things that trigger. We have these little red and green triangles that appear on the chart. And simply, the red triangle tells us that this is now a downtrend move, and the green triangles tell us that this is an uptrend move. In China, where I spent a certain amount of time, there is a wonderful noodle dish called uh, Magi Mian. Ants, you, in English it's ants crawling on noodles or ants crawling on sticks. And that's exactly what this looks like. The first time I saw it, all these little ants crawling over the chart. But they're telling me that I can go short here and I can remain consistently short to around here. Of course, I've got some green signals here. Why do I ignore them? Wait a moment, I'll explain. The red triangles tells me, go short, stay short. The green ants tell me, go long, stay long. That's just applied to the raw range bar chart. When we combine them, we get a different situation. Now, either you're short-sighted or you've got a question that you want to ask. You can move closer if you want to, or short-sighted further back, or anyway. So let's look at how we put all these together, because that's our classic ants. It's just an algorithm that provides the entry and exit signals and ongoing confirmation of the trend direction. So if I'm worried that this rally here is a problem, if I still have ants showing, red ants firing, I'm going to stay short. So the ants set up. First of all, we're looking for compression in the short term and long term GMMA. That's a classic condition. Then we're looking for confirmation of that change by a change in the range bar colour and then confirmation again with the ANTS entry signal inside an entry channel. So let's put this into some charts. First of all, compression in the long term group and the short term group. And you can see that this is developing in this area here. Yes, it's a bit after this peak, but we had this pullback here, but it didn't give the same signal. So this pullback here was a pullback within a rising trend. We can ignore it. It's only this pullback that develops at this point that tells us this is now an increased probability of a trend change. So I'm prepared to go short here and follow that down. So it's a classic condition, but it's to a super guppy. So we know that this is, it helps identify where the bubbles are. What's the reverse of a bubble? I'm not, not, not a bust. I mean, we get a bubble here. Obviously, everything's expanded dramatically. At the bottom end of a downtrend, you get the same situation. I'm not sure what it is. Inverse bubble, for want of a better word. So we've got this bubble that's taking place here. So there's a higher probability this trend is actually going to change. The first, the classic condition, is the compression within the two groups of moving averages. 
is followed by a change in the range bar colour. So we've got this move that's taking place here. Prior to the actual crossover that takes place in the long-term group of moving averages, we get a change in the colour of the range bars. That is confirmation that this is a genuine change in the trend, that there's now a high probability that the GMMA signal that is developing in that area will develop into a change in the trend. The change in the range bar colour is a visual thing. This is also set up so that you can get a message on your handphone or portable electronic device or whatever that says, wake up, open up this chart, have a look at it because there's an entry opportunity developing. This is why this is not a trading system as such. Andrew's going to tell you all about defining wonderful trading systems later on. I don't have that particular skill. What we're looking at here, this alerts me to the opportunity and gives me this wonderful opportunity to make the right decision or the wrong one. It still comes back to me, I can't blame the system. What are our entry conditions? Then, in terms of entry set up three, we've got compression long-term group, we've got the signals that are telling us, yes, get ready. Then we have a place, an upper and lower entry range on the chart. This is done automatically. What we're looking for is an ANTS entry signal, the triangles, that take place within that entry channel. That's the third and final confirmation. Compression, get ready. Change bar, it's ready to move. Get ready to take your entry position. Your entry signal is confirmed there. You can choose to enter anywhere within those red arrows. But there are a number of conditions. First of all, you wait for the breakout to develop. This is not trading in anticipation of a trend change. We're waiting for the change to be confirmed, compression, colour change and signal. Secondly, we don't chase the breakout. Chasing the breakout means that there's the signal, oh, we can get in here because that's much lower. We don't chase it down. When the signal's there and it's within our entry range, we act on that signal. The entry point is inside the entry zone, within that entry range, within this trading band. And you enter on a retreat and a rebound. So what we're looking for, come down here, we've got this rally takes place, there's our first signal, it comes down again, rebounds, there's our second entry signal, that's the one we take in preference. We've followed this down. We're not worried about what happens here. If we miss all of that, then we can enter on this third triangle here, which is not as good, but it gives us an entry signal. We're looking for the red ants algorithms, the red ants triangles, to continue to tell us it's safe to remain in the trade. But the ants colour must match the bar colour. You will occasionally get green ant signals in this area. Green ants in the territory are nasty little biting creatures. They'll bite you on this as well. We're always looking to signal the colour of the triangle must be the colour of the direction. Red from when we're going down, green from when we're going up. Complete reverse if we're trading a China market. If we get a green signal within this downtrend, it's ignored because the signal is not the same colour as the direction of the trend. The best entry is at the edge of the super guppy. So there's our super guppy. Our best signals are the first two ants entry signals. These ones are still OK, but by preference, we want to move quickly. The others are confirmation signals. They'll continue to show red all the way as the trend goes down. And we use an ATR as a stop loss. A DR gives us the five pairs, the one we're going to choose out of that five. We look at all five. When these entry conditions develop, on one of those five pairs, that's when we enter. Then we use an ATR stop. Now the ATR target is 75% of the value of the five day average range. It has an 85% probability of being achieved. This applies consistently within the FX market. It applies very, very consistently within index markets. S&P, E-minis, etc. It applies very consistently in commodity markets. 
and it applies pretty well in blue chip equity markets. So it's best in FX, it's least effective, still effective, but least effective in equity markets, so a declining group. But this 85% probability of 75% of the ADR, that's a tradable environment. And this is how it works. So we've made our entry up in here on the second ant. We managed the trade using the ATR as a stop loss line. ATR is on the top of the range bar chart. If we have a close above, not a touch, a close above the ATR line, then the trade is closed, irrespective of whether it achieves its target or not. There is no ant signal when the price is outside of the entry channel. ATR line change, all the rest of it. So ATR will change colour. Here you can see that there's a new ATR calculation as the market begins to move down. This takes place in real time, it's not a retrospective display. So we've got our initial signal with ATR up there, changing colour, compression, and entry signal, follow it down. Two ways to trade. First, here's our 75% target on the five day ADR for this particular currency pair. It's achieved here. This is a problem. Greed sets in. Greed is simple. Greater returns expected every day. So at 75%, this is where you get out. Take it home, be happy with it. It might be 60 pips, it might be 100 pips, it might be 150 pips. Depends on the ADR value. However, exit here is not confirmed with an ATR exit. So we waited. Sorry. My son waited <laughs> for a close above the ATR, hoping to chase this downtrend further. Touch, exit here. Didn't do quite as well as he would have liked. An exercise in discipline. It's a judgment thing. This is our preferred exit point. And you will miss some long-term continuations of the trades. Up to you. You can follow it down. We, yeah, there's no simple answer. I'd love to say there's a simple way out of that. There's not. It depends on your appetite for profits, how much you're prepared to put at risk to keep that particular sort of trade going on. Let me finish up here. So, here's GUP AUD, February 27, 2015. There's our entry point. Not quite as close to the top of the trading range as we'd like, but it's close to the top of the long-term GMMA. Continuation of ANTS signals all the way down through the trade. Our 75% level was not quite achieved. So in this case, our exit is based on the close above the ATR value. It's got a 85% probability of being achieved, oh sorry, 85% probability of being achieved, there's a 15% probability it won't be achieved. This is one of the 15%. But the ATR value still catches it. So we got 97 pips out of that particular trade. Trade period, 1700, hour and a half, 90 minutes. Range bar chart, not a time-based chart. Questions before I go on to, to this information here? You can shout and I'll repeat, that's not a problem. Oh, right, okay. There's a gentleman down the front here who either has a twitch or a question, one or the other. Um, range bars, do you start plotting that from the very, very first data point that you have? From the very first data second. point. So when the, uh, when the chart comes up, you can do this on MT4, you can do this on Anders screens, you can do it with Chart IQ. They're the current um, situations that offer it. You can also do it with eSignal as well you can select a range bar chart and they will automatically calculate and display the range bar. 
you need to set the value of the range bar. There's a previous slide there that says, depending on which pairs you're trading or which instruments you're trading, what the preferred size is. But the chart is going to look different depending on your, the first price, right? At the first price, you're using a data point that's stretching back years and years and years. Don't need to worry about it. In exactly the same way, if I used your argument again, um, if I'm using a, uh, a time-based chart, it will look different depending on when my data point starts as well. Yeah, but in a, in a time-based chart, you have, I guess, three different starts for the effects. But if you're using a 10-range bar, you could have 10 different starts. You could. However, because your data streams are long enough, that's not a problem. You're working with the right-hand side of the chart, not the left-hand side. So that washes out over time. More questions? I didn't think I was that perfectly clear. There's two down the front here. Young lady first. Ladies first, ladies first. Um, would you mind um, letting us know when most of your signals trigger? Do you find it's during the European US sessions? We get a, we get a significant number of our signals in the opening of the European session, which is where we prefer to trade. We know there are a lot more signals in the open of the US session, but we're asleep. We don't bother trading those. There are a significant number of signals that take place within our own trading sessions. So they're across the board. They're there. So the key starting point is the selection of those five, five currency pairs as a starting point. Then we will look at those which will generate the, the entry signal. You get much more activity as European session, as the London session opens, and you can trade through that. In terms of um, uh, E-minis and so on, obviously you're trading US session in that sense. But we find that this applies effectively across indices within our region as well. So you can apply it to the SPY, you can apply it to the Nikkei and so on. Works pretty well on DAX. And um, what percentage of signals, um, FX signals, would trigger during the Asian session, roughly? You mean across the five pairs? Across whatever pairs you choose. Just on average. I'm not too sure I can give you a reasonable answer to that uh, because our objective is simply to do one trade a night. Then he's allowed to go to sleep. So he's simply not staying awake for that period. Remember, we've got a short-term objective. I don't want to run an overnight position. I'm not prepared to take that risk. What I'm looking for is that five-day range. I want to achieve that 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 pips, whatever that 75% value is, and that's it. Close off, go to bed. I don't need to trade extra opportunities because the key advantage in the FX market is the depth of liquidity. So I can do one trade confident that it's going to be correct and take a maximum size within that trade. Now the reality is when we're equity trading, we like to think we know what we're doing, but our patterns of trading suggest that we don't. And that is that most of us will hold, well, I can ask an embarrassing question, counting all of your open positions, including those that are so deep underwater since 2008 that you don't want to think about them, <laughs> those ones you've opened recently, who's got 10 open positions at the moment across your trading and your SMS? Who's got 20 open positions? Who's got 30? There's my answer. So I don't want 10 open positions. We're having 10 open positions because we think there's a whole range of different opportunities or subconsciously we're thinking it's called diversification. If I have this one, this one and this one, when that one goes down and that one goes down, the other two will keep me afloat. Many fund managers, they do the same sort of thing. But with an FX market, I don't want to do that. I've got a single position. That's where all of my son's inheritance goes. <laughs> That's a powerful motivator, by the way. So just one last thing. So even though various components are automated, the final decision to enter a trade is manual. That's right. Okay. Exactly. There's that window of opportunity, the size that you want, the entry point that you want, that's your decision. And that's the difference between a trading system, which Andrew will talk about later to, uh, today or tomorrow, and discretionary trading. We still remain discretionary traders. That's in our core DNA. Oh, sorry, there's another question down here, and then there's one at the back and then I'm going to have to continue, otherwise I'm going to be... No, I've got another moment or two before I get scolded. 
Well, I've moved through uh, four different questions <laughs> since I put my hand up. So I'll have a go at this one. Right. Uh, just that last point, you talk, spoke about diversification and all the inheritance being in that one position. Uh, I'm not willing to sort of, at this moment, take that sort of call. But could you use these various um, uh, instruments you use, like uh, index uh, and uh, commodities, to actually uh, allow you to diversify uh, a bit of that risk? Uh, in, but also, uh, you asked about self-managed super funds, and uh, we know that uh, holding some shares, the proper shares for long term, it can be a, um, a nice way to, to get capital gains. Do you uh, still advocate uh, that type of old-fashioned trading, uh, if I can term it, uh, put it in those terms, based on your new uh, super guppy approach? Are you still interested in some uh, old hat trading? What was the, what was the movie? Um, eat, sleep and pray? We're investing is buy, hope and pray. Um, it doesn't really apply to, to SMF. I just wanted to use the example of how many stocks people were holding as an open. In terms of risk control, how do we manage this across asset classes, which is really the core of your question? And I was joking about my son's inheritance. Well, not entirely, but... <laughs> so, just to use a simple example, we've got $100,000 in trading capital. For an equity position, we will allocate $20,000 per position. For a CFD position, we will allocate $10,000 per position. For an FX position, we'll allocate $5,000. So that allocation within the portfolio reflects the risk profiles in each of these instruments. I hope that answers your question. Yep. Okay, there's one more question down the back. So yeah, look, we still trade equities. I still trade long-term SMF stuff, but for the day-to-day -day bread and butter, for the holidays in Bali, for new cars and that sort of stuff, this is what I trade. Yes? Um, to a certain extent, um, the liquidity is, is infinite, and people say, with the, uh, with the FX market. But in my experience, you can get considerable slippage. You can. Um, and particularly when there's a changeover of the day, even on the Euro USD, yep. you can you can be slipped. Uh, you know, instead of your normal one or one and a half pips yep. uh, spread, they'll, it'll be ten or fifteen. Quite agree. So solutions: one, you make sure your FX provider is giving you the tightest spreads possible. Our preferred FX provider is sitting down here, and we use that because of tight spreads. Secondly, we don't trade the opens and we don't trade news events precisely because your slippage expands dramatically. So we're not trying to get into events that are developing. We simply want to be able to take the safest trades, and I know that might be an oxymoron when you're talking FX, the safest trades within an FX environment. The key factors that I want to look at. Because of changes in the equity market, and we don't think those changes are going to be reversed, then what we find is our analysis techniques are effective, but our execution techniques are not giving us the trade results that we wanted. We shifted initially to CFD markets. Better, but not as good as they ought to be. There are still problems with there, and there are a whole range of problems with CFD execution. We then decided to shift to FX markets for greater leverage. But we had to change A, the way we analysed those markets, B, the way we understood them, and C, our trading timeframes. The solution that I use, that I've talked about, is not one that's going to suit everybody. It's just some ideas that you can think about, you can play about. Go to OANDA, go to MT4, it's all sitting there on the screens, see what it does for you. But there are several advantages. First of all, the GMMA based on the range bar. That has given us significant changes in the reliability of GMMA signals. Doesn't work with equity charts, but it does work with index, commodity, and FX charts. Secondly, the super guppy gives us a better understanding of where the bubble volatility is. And we're talking about bubbles and busts at the moment. That gives us a better understanding of the bubble, so when a retreat develops, it's within the context of a trend and not a trend change. It gives us better confirmation of the trend change taking place. The ANTS indicator, the algorithm that sits there, 
helps us to identify the best entry timing on a range bar chart and a continuation of the trend. Again, it's the reliability. Managing it, we use the trader's application of average true range. In other words, it's plotted on the chart that gives us a valid method of understanding changes in volatility that may lead to a change in trend. Many, many years ago, I wrote my first book, we used the countback line to capture that volatility. The CBL concept is still valid and important, but we're finding in the current market that its reliability has been reduced. We've replaced it with ATR, traders ATR application, and are getting more consistent results out of that. When we apply it to a range bar chart, consistency is much, much better. And by using the reaction bands and the trading bands, it makes sure that we're entering within the right sorts of range and the right sorts of places. I'm going to finish maybe just a little bit early. I know you can't read Chinese. It says, Jian Shan, Bu Shan. The mountain you see is not the mountain. And when we come to trading, whether it be equity markets or FX markets, it's exactly the same. Because what it's saying is the problem that you think is the problem is not the real problem. The problem that you think is the problem in terms of strategy, the market's too high, the market's going to collapse, the bubble's creating, all the rest of it, that's not the problem. The problem is how you trade. The problem is how you assess the risk and manage the risk in every trade you take. Strategy describes the environment. It's really great. I went on the net the other day and I checked the environment for the Gold Coast. It was wrong. It's exceptionally cold. The secular trend might be warm, but I can tell you, yesterday was cold, today's not much better. So what's important is what we actually develop, not what we expect to develop. All of my winter clothes are in Singapore. <laughs> why are they in Singapore? Because why should I carry winter clothes from Darwin to Singapore when I'm going to Beijing? Better to leave them in Singapore and then take them just to Beijing when I need them. When you want them, they're not available. You have no idea. Sydney was two degrees when I got off the aeroplane last night and they made a stand on the, on the, on the tarmac with this cold wind coming off the Antarctic. So, strategic outlook is one thing, how you manage it, how you trade it, that's the key factor. What you think the problem is, the strategy, is not always the real problem. The real problem is the way you identify and manage the trade. Investors worry about how to enter. Traders, we worry about how to exit. The ANT system and the application through there gives us a method to manage the entry, but more importantly, it gives us a method to manage the exit and to capture a reasonable return within that FX environment, within an index environment, with a high level of probability. And for me, that's the sort of thing that I'm looking at comfortably trading over the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you very much for your time and attention.